Good morning. Uh, Mary T. and uh, Nancy, thank you both for your leadership. Nancy, thank you for being here today. And uh, congratulations and blessings to both Debbie and, and Heather. Uh, well deserved for both of you. Uh, this morning we're going to turn our attention to the second chapter um, in Mike Slaughter's little book, Dare to Dream, as we uh, continue in our congregation-wide book study. Last week we saw that God has a dream for God's world. Um, God has a hope for God's world, and that each of us has a unique uh, role to play within God's larger purpose and dream for the world. Each one of us is gifted to build for the kingdom. Today we're going to continue that conversation, pushing a little bit further by reflecting on the passage that Patty just shared with us from the letter to the Ephesians. And as we do, I want us to keep a couple things in mind, an observation and a few questions that Mike Slaughter offers this week to kind of frame our, um, frame our thinking about um, this section of Ephesians. First, uh, Mike wants us to see that God's dream for us, God's calling or our mission, is something that will always honor God, bless others, and bring us joy. Honor God, bless others, and will bring us joy. When we're living into God's dream for us, life becomes about more than mere survival. Remember Jacob last week running from his brother Esau. It's about more than just sort of going through the motions of life or even the motions of our faith. Life becomes, when we're, when we're giving ourselves to God's dream and hope for the world, life becomes beautiful, rich, full, and good. Not always happy, necessarily, not always easy, but joyful. And one of the ways that we can prayerfully discern what is my or what is, what is your unique place within God's dream and God's hope for the world <clears throat> is to reflect on a few questions. Praying over these questions and even better, wrestling with them uh, in community where we have good and holy friends to push us a bit, to, to hold us accountable, maybe to help us see things that we can't otherwise see. And so the questions are, um, where do you see the greatest need around you in, in our um, neighborhoods, in our community, in the world? And it's okay if you see things different from one another. There are lots of needs, so you may discern what the greatest need is in a way that's different from your neighbor. What can you do to help, with God's help, meet that need? And finally, what gifts do you bring to that work, to that mission? Where do you see the greatest need? Um, what do you bring to, to address that need? And um, how can you help meet it with God's help? And when we answer that question, those questions well and lean into God's hope and dream for the world and the mission to which we are called, we, we honor God, bless others, and experience great joy. Writing to the church in Ephesus, Paul reminds the early Christians that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is now at work in and through them, that they are filled with the presence and power of God to be the people of God to use their unique gifts to live kingdom lives. That is, they and we can live lives that look like Jesus, that resemble Christ and the kingdom that he brought, because God is with us, and God is at work through us. You may recall from our brief walk through Ephesians last summer, uh, Pastor Jim actually preached on this, test, this text. I know you all remember every word that he said. Um, <laughs> I, I know you don't because he and I joked about that this week and we said um, on some, uh, some Mondays we can't remember what we said. So um, you get a pass there. But I'm sure it was a great sermon. You can go back and find it on the website listen to it. Um, you may recall from that that, um, that Ephesians speaks directly to a Gentile audience. That is to people who prior to faith were basically ordinary, secular, non-Jewish, outside the promises of God people to people who were once beyond the covenant that God had made with Jacob's 
with, with Jacob's people. And to that audience, the claim is made that, that followers of Christ have been joined together, knit together in one body into a holy temple in which God is pleased to dwell. And it means that followers of Jesus, followers of Christ, are then called to abandon those old Gentile ways and to live life in a new way, in a way that points others to God's hope and dream for the world. Paul then reminds them to lead a life worthy of their calling, to understand that they are caught up in a larger story, that God's dream of a world reconciled and healed and made new is now taking place in and through them, that we are like Jacob and so many others before us, participants in God's dream. Or to say it more simply, what, what the writer of Ephesians is trying to help us understand is that our identity is now in Christ. This is who we are. No matter who you were before, Paul's saying, whatever Gentile identity you had before this, you are now, uh, you belong to Christ. God has a claim on your life. We've been uniquely gifted by the Spirit, and in baptism, I said this last Sunday, commissioned for the work of ministry. Remember, we, um, some of us wear stoles, uh, which are a sign of our ordination. That's our role for the mission of God, God's dream. Uh, but, but all of you could get one of these. I can tell you where to order one, if you'd like one. Um, it's an alb, and it's a, it's, a, it's a baptismal garment. Remember, it's a reminder that we are together the baptized, and together we are commissioned, all of us, to, to live out God's hope and dream for the world. Ministry begins there with our baptisms. That's who we are, Paul says. That's who you are, claimed by God for the mission of Christ. Um, that is God's larger dream for us. And each and every one of us matters has a role to play. And that particular role that we play is what Mike Slaughter calls our birthright. That thing for which we were created. The particular way in which we can use our, our, our very life to lean into God's hope and dream for the world. One of the interesting things about this section is that um, what Paul uh, does here is that when he speaks of the calling on our lives, he starts with the big picture, and, and then he moves to the particular. Um, before, but before he gets to the unique gifts that each of us bring, he, he, he starts with, with God's big hope and dream for the world. The calling of the gospel, he calls it. And the calling of the gospel, that larger dream to which the whole church is called, or the whole church is summoned to, that, that great big mission that we've been given in baptism is to trust Christ as Lord and give our lives in an undivided way to Him. That's our calling. At the most basic level, that's who we are. A people invited to, to trust Christ as Lord and give our lives to Him. And when we do, Paul says, we become truly free. Free to live the life God intends for us to live. And when we do that, our lives look a particular way. They look like Jesus. Um, I remember from a few years back, the what would Jesus do bracelets? Um, we, well, we actually kind of know what he did, would do. <laughs> we have the whole example of his life which is the example for our life together as a people called to God's dream. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I'm, I am a bit of a work in progress most days, um, more on some days than others. I said at 8 o'clock, I, I shared a little story with him. I said, it's, it's safe to say it because it's not being recorded, but this one's being recorded um, <laughs> and streamed. Um, Kim's not watching, though. She'll be here at 11. But um, I remember one day distinctly sitting in the office uh, when I was a district superintendent, and she was leaving the house, and she came by and she said, you know, I don't like you very much right now. 
I love you and I'll see you later, but I don't like you. And uh, that, that was one of those days when I was a long way from God's dream and call. We all have those days. I don't even remember what I had done, but probably deserved that comment. Um, so I, you wonder maybe, how do we do this? How can we live like Christ? That's a pretty tall order. Paul helps us here by pointing, um, of all places, to Moses. And he says, you remember Moses after the Exodus? The people have been set free to live life that God has called them to. Moses goes up on the mountain, receives the law, comes back down from the mountain, descends back to the people, gives the law to the people so that they can then live the life God intends for them to live. They can live into God's dream. Paul says Jesus is not unlike Moses, who ascends into heaven after his death and resurrection, after the, the new exodus, which sets people free to live the life that they're called to. Jesus ascends to be with the Father, only in descending, what does he do? He pours out the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descending onto the life of the church, empowering God's people to live the life to which they are called, to live God's dream, to follow Christ in his ministry of reconciling love. Each, each one of us with different gifts and abilities, a birthright, our own unique calling and place within God's hope and dream for the world. So this life is possible because God is with us. The Spirit has been given to us. God has richly gifted the church in order that we might be the people God dreams of us being. God does not call us to something that God does not equip us for. A people that love and forgive like Jesus, to be a people who embody hope, who offer freedom, who can multiply loaves and fish and feed the masses, a people who bring new life wherever they go, a people whose life together is a glimpse of God's dream in a world that for too many people must feel like a nightmare. God has so gifted us, filled us with grace, that the church can be, we can be together, the ongoing incarnation, the love of God in the flesh, for the world, an embodiment of God's hope and dream. Now, quite often, um, when we think about the gifts that God has poured out on the life of the church to make our life together as God's dreamers possible, we, we oftentimes talk about those as kind of the talents and abilities that, that people have. And so we value people because of the talents and the, the abilities that they have that we think are useful then for the work of the church. But what if the gifts God has given to the church are not so much talents and abilities, but people? Imperfect people like Jacob, who have a, a role to play, a birthright. People given to the body, with, without whom the body would be incomplete. It just may be that God is going to bring God's dream into being by giving us each other. Friends, you, you are the gifts God has given to the church. And each one with a different birthright. Some would be apostles, Paul says, some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds or pastors, some teachers. By the gift of one another... We live God's dream in and for the world. We live a life that resembles Christ together. God in God's wisdom has called you to this place because you are a gift God believes this church needs. You are integral to the mission of the body. And it, the body is incomplete without you. Which is why Christ welcomed everyone to the feast. Kim and I are um, at an age in life where um, our, our house is more quiet. Those of you with children will know this. Um, they are out living their lives, which is what we raise them to do. Uh, but we, we now eat dinner around a little kitchen table most nights together. It's not the same. 
It's quiet. Some, you know, most days we really love it. But then there are those moments when they're all home. And everybody's around the table. And that's better. That's just better. Um, it matters. Uh, if you're here, connected with the body, whether you're, you're worshiping with us online or you're physically present, it matters that you're engaged and here. The body is not the same without you. You matter. And some of you are like apostles. You, you, you are sent out from this place week in and week out to share the love of Christ with others. You expand the reach of the church. And some are like prophets. You speak the truth to power in love. You call us to be better than we would otherwise be. You are a thorn in the flesh of the body of Christ. And we are better because of you. You, you helped perfect the life and witness of the church. Some among us are evangelists. Good news is always on your lips. You are the people of the second chance. And, and you increase the size of the church. Some are like shepherds. Uh, you care well for others. You, you carry burdens. You bind up wounds. You're compassionate and loving and prayerful and supportive. You, you enlarge the heart of the church. Some are teachers. You are dispensers of wisdom. We learn from you and sit at your feet. You help us discern and drink from deep wells. You enrich the mind of the church. And when we live together with one another and value, value each and every gift, that is, not those talents and abilities that we all have that are useful, but rather when we value each and every person as a gift that God has sent our way, we become a people who live God's dream. So Paul says, lead a life worthy of that calling. God's dream of a better world. Lead it with humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the bond of peace, trusting that God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. And God will do this because God has filled the church with an abundance of gifts with you a people with a birthright who put hands and feet on their faith every day and in so doing become for the world the love of God in the flesh. Thanks be to God. Amen.